Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Intro to Tech Equity webinar. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes as we wait for the room to fill in. Uh, so feel free to hang tight, introduce yourselves in the chat if you'd like, uh, and I'll keep repeating this message a couple of times, but we'll get started in about one or two minutes. Thank you. everyone welcome to the intro to tech equity webinar we're going to get started in just a couple of minutes we're just waiting for the room to fill in i'll keep repeating this message a couple of times but we'll get started in a minute or two Welcome to those of you just joining us. We're gonna get started in about a minute. We're just waiting for the room to fill a little. Uh, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat if you'd like, I'll grab a glass of water. Uh, we'll get started shortly. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. So I want to say uh, hello to everyone that's joining us for our Intro to Tech Equity webinar today. I hope you all can hear and see me. Uh, my name is Herman Calderon. I'm the Community Manager at Tech Equity Collaborative. And in my role, I get to engage with our supporters uh, through event series, volunteer opportunities, and I get to engage with you all here. So feel free to drop in questions into the Q&A box that's on the bottom of your screens as we go through the presentation, uh, but we won't answer any of those questions until the end. So here's a little bit about what we'll talk about today. We'll cover why Tech Equity exists as an organization and how we got started. We'll talk about the key issues we've identified to help us understand problems that need to be solved and how we can take action to address some of our most pressing economic issues. Uh, we'll begin with why we're here. Well, Tech Equity got started because some of its founders and early members saw the symptoms of growing inequity within their own neighborhoods, and they understood that there was this perception that tech and tech workers were the cause of the problem. So they noticed things such as rising rents, increases in displacement, increases in traffic, and increases in people experiencing homelessness all around them. And as they talked to others, they realized that they weren't alone in their concerns and that they as tech workers were uniquely positioned to help contribute to solutions. Especially now in the face of the pandemic, we're seeing that this affordability crisis gets uh, much worse with an increased burden placed on lower income people and communities of color. And many of our neighbors are uncertain today as to how they'll continue to manage what was already an untenable situation. And at the same time, tech workers have remained relatively unscathed. So as a result of the pandemic uh, that we've been experiencing this last couple of years, uh, we might see further uh, inequality in our region, um, similar to what uh, some of our founders had experienced before. So because of this affordability crisis, communities are frustrated and it really comes to no surprise. I know for myself, I've grown up in the Bay Area my whole life and I've kind of been able to see both sides of the coin. Um, I have friends and family who have, uh, you know, been worried these last couple of years with the changes they're seeing in their communities, what that means for their homes, what that means for their jobs for their commutes, their education, just really all aspects of life, but also have friends and family who have pursued jobs within the tech industry and have found lots, lots of success for themselves and for their families alike. However, we see that when uh, tech, you know, shoulders the blame, it starts to create this us versus them dynamic that's further dividing communities. And we know that tech workers care and that they want to help and that they want to contribute to this deepening, they don't want to contribute to this deepening divide within our communities. So while we're all unsure as to how long we'll manage uh, this new normal that's caused by the pandemic, like we talked about further exacerbating inequality already in our region, it's important to note that many in the tech sector have remained relatively unscathed. Um, and more, th more than most other sectors, uh, tech has really been able to make that transition to working from home with little uh, to no disruption. And now more than ever, tech workers and tech companies 
have an opportunity to support more equitable solutions in our communities. And we have an opportunity to use our unique positions of privilege to support our neighbors, but it can be hard to know how to best uh, engage, especially in times of such uncertainty. So this is the state of our affordability crisis in the Bay Area. I think the fact that rents are rising isn't really a surprise to anyone on this call because we all know this, we feel this, we've heard this from friends and families. And while some Californians are very successful in the tech driven economy here, the average salaries for tenants have actually decreased slightly. And we're showing stats for California because that's where we're based as an organization and it's where tech is headquartered. But a version of the story is playing out all across the country. And it really is a sharp contrast with the narrative of tech success. And without tech at the table to work together to address our shared crisis, it's understandable as to why community members are frustrated like we just talked about. So before the pandemic, unemployment was hovering around 4% mark and people were already struggling to make ends meet. And when the virus hit, unemployment claims spiked to 16%, which is a more dramatic spike than our last recession. So in the span of about a month, we lost decades worth of recovery. And as instability and uncertainty continues, we'll see more of our neighbors being pushed into homelessness or worse. So at Tech Equity, we're as optimistic as ever about the tech industry's potential to drive broad-based growth that's accessible to everyone, but it's clear that it won't happen on its own. We have to invest in the people and the institutions that are serving our communities, and we have to show up. And we have to do so in partnership with those in our community that are feeling the most pain if we're to dismantle this notion that tech is the enemy. We believe that a more engaged tech sector is a more ethical tech sector, that connecting tech workers and companies to issues where they live in will result in more ethical decisions at work and more engagement in our communities. And we know we can do this and the first step is to show up and you all have done a great first step by signing on to this webinar today. Our goal at Tech Equity is to change the conditions in which the tech sector is growing. We believe effective structural change will eliminate a culture and policies that have institutionalized inequity, leading to stronger and more resilient communities. And we help tech workers approach these big problems and engage in system change in three major ways. So our programs educate you about the most critical civic issues where you live. And we do this in a variety of ways. We host uh, book club discussions, panel discussions, you know, on relevant topics about what's going on within the industry. Uh, we have webinars such as this one that you're on today and we produce voter guides and voter uh, recommendations around election season. So we'll have some uh, this season before the elections. We advocate for public policy that rebalances power and builds economic equity. So a perfect example of this was in 2019, we helped pass the Tenant Protection Act, uh, which extends protections to 8 million California renters, preventing unjust evictions and price gouging of rents. And finally, there's corporate practice aiming to turn companies into agents of change in the broader community. And we do this through our corporate partnerships programs and engagements with companies. So those are the three key ways uh, about how the organization works. And tech workers have this outsized political power that's largely been untapped to when it comes to public policy advocacy. And we know that tech, connecting tech workers to outside perspectives builds more empathy and ethical practices in our workplaces and products and in our surrounding communities. So at Tech Equity, our two issue areas are housing and workforce and labor. And while housing costs are a core part of a lot of the issues that we're seeing in our communities, these two issues really are intertwined and intersect in a variety of ways because where you live affects your access to opportunity and what job you have affects where you're able to afford to live. Our goal is bold, comprehensive change by companies and government that's led by the tech workforce. And these issues have only gotten more urgent in the face of the pandemic, but we're all well positioned to adapt our agenda uh, to these new realities. And while the pandemic has exposed the cracks of our um, economy, these underlying issues have existed in our economy for decades. So let's learn a little bit more about uh, the inequity in our neighborhoods and the history behind them. Uh, the affordability crisis is decades in the making, and the policy choices we've made over the course of decades have set us up for this level of pain that our community is feeling, especially now during the pandemic. 
So in the 1930s, the federal government instituted a policy that still felt today, especially by communities of color in the Bay Area, in California, and all across the country. And that policy is redlining. So redlining, it was a process in which the homeowners loan corporation, a federal agency, gave neighborhoods ratings uh, to get investment. And this policy is named for the red or uh, hazardous neighborhoods that were deemed riskiest. So on maps, those neighborhoods were literally redlined. Um, and those communities that were deemed risky investments or redlined didn't receive uh, any investment. So with the image on the screen, that's a map of San Francisco and all those red blocks are examples of historically redlined uh, neighborhoods within the city. And these neighborhoods that were predominantly home to communities of color, and it really is by no accident, these hazardous ratings were in large part based on racial demographics. So in other words, redlining was a discriminatory and a racist policy, and it made it hard for residents to get loans for home ownership or for maintenance of their homes for something like building a new roof. And consequently, redlining led to cycles of disinvestment, including development and production within these neighborhoods. So there's a terrible history of underinvestment, underbuilding, ex and exclusion in our country. And often those communities that have been historically underinvested and have been redlined are the very same communities that are at risk of gentrification today. So the crisis we're living in is decades in the making, uh, way before tech, and it's not unique to the Bay Area. It extends across California and across the country. So these are examples of redlined neighborhoods in Austin and Atlanta. Both of these cities are current up and coming tech hubs, but historically also have been uh, redlined in the past. So by preventing entire neighborhoods from being able to access this capital, these neighborhoods were unable to build the schools that they needed, uh, small businesses, and a community that fostered economic success and opportunity. And it caused many of the people who lived in red line neighborhoods for generations to fall in and stay in liquid asset poverty. Now, you may be asking yourselves, what is liquid asset poverty? Well, someone is considered to be in liquid asset poverty if they don't have enough savings to cover the basic expenses for three months after experiencing an income shock, like a global pandemic that affects their income, a huge rent increase, a sudden loss of a job, your car breaks down and you don't have enough money to cover the, the repairs. And it impacts almost one out of three Californians. So 33.9% of Californians are in liquid asset poverty and people of color and lower income people are affected at much higher rates with 41.2% of African-American households in liquid asset poverty and 56.2% of Latino households in liquid asset poverty. And there really isn't a single reason as to why all this is happening, uh, but many years of policy decisions have led to these outcomes, which are especially burdensome for communities of color. And these policy decisions have often predated tech's arrival, but tech workers can now take a role in supporting better policies moving forward. The twin forces of a housing shortage, particularly with affordable housing and wages that don't cover the cost of living, have created a regional crisis that has hindered opportunity, growth, and prosperity for families and businesses alike. And as you can imagine, these statistics will likely be impacted by the outcome of the pandemic. Uh, like we talked about, many people in our communities were already struggling. And as pandemic recovery continues to be starkly uneven, and unequal, many of our neighbors are facing increased instability and likely will for years to come if we don't implement solutions. Next, uh, as we can see, the hourly pay for workers has not increased much the last couple of decades, even though productivity of, uh, has dramatically increased. So according to the Economic Policy Institute, the share of workers covered by a collective bargaining agreement, aka unions, dropped from 27% to 11.6%, between 1979 and 2019, meaning that the union coverage rate is now less than half where it was 40 years ago. And it means that employees have less bargaining power to advocate for pay rates in alignment with the work that they're delivering. And while all workers have lost out because of this, um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color are the most impacted. And while there's a gap between worker pay and productivity, like we just talked about, there's also a gap between race. White men are earning more cents to the dollar. It's that orange bar in comparison to Black men and women, the two blue bars on the right side. And because Black, Indigenous, and people of color are getting paid less and disproportionately, they're not able to afford living in cities that are providing these good jobs. 
and the cost of living here were already high. So let's take a look at how a worker earning minimum wage fares in the current rental market. So this is what it takes to afford an average two bedroom apartment in San Francisco. If you're making $133,000 uh, a year, you can afford the average two bedroom working a regular eight hour day. However, if you're making minimum wage in San Francisco, you need to work 40 hours a day to afford that two bedroom. Again, if you're earning minimum wage, you need to work 40 hours a day to afford that two bedroom. So there's only 24 hours in a day. So we're setting up an impossible situation for low wage workers to be able to afford uh, living in the city where they wanna work. And this problem persists across the country, even though costs in up and coming tech cities like Austin, Denver, Atlanta aren't as high um, as San Francisco, the cost of living is still unreasonable for anyone that's earning um, minimum wage. And in San Francisco, it's not just uh, people outside the tech sector that's struggling to afford the city. There's this common misconception that all tech workers are paid these lavish salaries. However, not every salaried employee is making six figures. Some salaried tech employees like those in customer success or marketing are paid salaries that are still considered to be low income within the Bay Area. And even further away from this image of the wealthy tech worker are the thousands of contractors and contingent workers like security guards, custodians, cooks, bus drivers, who are working long hours to maintain tech companies, but are receiving minimum benefits and are not paid as much. So you have to have a good salary to afford your apartment, but why is your apartment so expensive to begin with? Well, rents are going up due in part to lack of supply. And this chart is showing us what we should be building. So the state sets goals for how much housing local communities should build to keep up with demand and population growth. And these are called RHNA goals or RAINA goals. And that stands for Regional Housing Needs Allocation. And as you can see, we're doing a pretty good job in meeting our RAINA goal for the above moderate income housing bracket. That's that big blue bar on the right side of your screen. And that's affordable to people making a good salary but we're not building anywhere close enough for lower and moderate income people. And those are the two small uh, red bars on the left side of your screen. So as housing costs have skyrocketed with production of affordable housing not being matched, working class residents and communities of color have been driven out of our urban core and pushed into the outer edges of our region, further away from job centers and supportive services. And some residents have been displaced from the region altogether. So remember when someone at, just tells you that we need to build more housing. It's important that we ask them, build more housing for whom? Again, we're not building enough housing at lower levels of affordability. And because we're not building enough housing at lower levels of affordability, lower and middle income people are leaving our communities at higher rates while people with higher incomes are coming in and staying in. So this chart is showing us how people in lower incomes, those are the orange bars, have left San Francisco at higher rates while people with higher incomes have increased migration into the city. And people beneath 30% AMI are in a more drastic situation where they can't even afford to leave San Francisco and as they're being pushed into homelessness or worse. So that's actually why that last blue bar is actually increasing uh, because there just isn't enough affordable housing available to help support the most vulnerable people in our community. And amongst people of color, uh, the rates of displacement are more tragic. So as we talked about earlier, Black and Latino populations are living in liquid asset poverty at uh, much higher rates. Furthermore, Black and Latino populations have been leaving San Francisco at higher rates these past couple of years. Combination of discriminatory housing laws, low wages, lack of affordable housing production have created really this crisis of displacement. And as we can see, displacement is driven by policy choices. And we may see this ratio of displacement continue to rise as the pandemic progresses. Like we talked about, the folks who are the most rent burdened are in low wage jobs and low wage jobs are the ones that are getting hit the hardest by this crisis. And we can't build our way out to solve our problems, but it is true that we don't have enough homes for people. Uh, the good news is that members at Tech Equity are showing up for the community. Uh, tech workers are members of the community and should be at the table working together alongside non-tech community members. And together we can advocate for solutions to our most pressing shared problems. And we have to work together to address these underlying issues that are driving inequity within our economy. So what can we do? 
So at Tech Equity, we envision a world where a growing tech-driven economy creates opportunity for everyone and where tech sector employees and companies are engaged and active participants in making our communities better places to live. So we've identified structural changes that need to happen in order to achieve this vision, but we won't be able to achieve this without the necessary policy changes. So here's what we've identified in the housing world. We need to take an above all approach to tackling our housing affordability crisis, and that starts with production. Building more housing, specifically at lower levels of affordability, and we can do this through zoning and permitting reform that brings down the cost of constructing housing by removing delays and lengthy administrative processes that make it too expensive to build. Preservation, making sure we provide more resources to subsidize and maintain and improve existing affordable housing. Protection, we need to protect existing tenants from displacement. So it's gonna take a long time to build the necessary housing that we need. So in the meantime, we need to make sure that renters are protected from displacement. Racial equity, racism is embedded in our economic, political, uh, social systems, it's embedded in us all, and especially in housing. That means that we have to be explicit about how racism and bias are upheld in housing. So we have to craft policy solutions that build racial equity in response. And especially now, we need to be thinking about short-term and long-term solutions to preservation and protection, because like we talked about, many of our neighbors are more at risk than ever as a result of the pandemic. We also need to make sure that we all get enough compensation and benefits to live a healthy and stable life. We want to ensure that companies are doing their part to contribute to the communities they exist within, that people in the surrounding communities are able to access these jobs, and that these jobs are paying fair wages and benefits regardless of the role. So we need to make sure that all workers are protected. Within the tech sector, we see large disparities emerging between headquarters, warehouse workers, and contracted workers. So in partnership with Silicon Valley Rising, Silicon Valley Rising, we created a standard that tech companies should implement for contract workers, which includes creating space for workers to have a voice, providing career mobility opportunities, good wages and benefits, making sure that the workplace is safe, and ensuring that there is fair scheduling. We need to expand and equip the workforce. So training as a standalone approach, uh, it's not going to lead us out of inequality and will not guarantee employment for most displaced workers. In order to solve this crisis, we must undertake multiple strategies, massive job programs, higher labor standards and protections for all jobs, and innovative recruitment, training, and development for new and diverse talent. And at the same time, the tech industry has an imperative to make its employee base more representative of the population at large, not just to create broader uh, economic opportunity, but because companies with diverse representation at all levels are more likely to be successful than those that aren't. And last, we need to make sure that everyone's basic needs are met. We need a new social contract that ensures that everyone has the basics to survive, and we must strengthen our social safety net so that no one falls uh, through the cracks. So this is how we work, and there's tons of ways to get involved. We host tons of educational events and social events. Uh, if you're interested in public policy, you can support some of our policies, which I'll be talking about next. You can share your contracting story if you're a contractor uh, in the tech industry, or you can support our contract worker disparity project, um, or reach out to me and I'll point you in the right direction. We can go a little bit more in depth about the work that we're doing and how you can participate. Uh, if you're interested in corporate practice, we offer a wide range of services to companies and provide ways for them to get more involved on these issues from employee engagement to policy advising, and you can reply to our follow-up email afterwards and we'll connect you with our corporate partnerships manager. So this is how we work. We try to make it as accessible and as easy to plug in while building community in the process. So this year's key initiatives uh, for our organization begin with the Contract Worker Disparity Project. It truly is the first of its kind worker center initiative that sheds light on the practice of contracting out and proposes and advocates for public policy solutions and partners with companies to adopt responsible contracting practices. Next, we have the Tech Bias and Housing Initiative, which is examining the promises and perils of housing technology. We aim to ensure that technological innovations in the housing space do not reinforce the racist uh, housing systems and policies of the past. Next, we have just passing economic justice policy. So every year, tech equity introduces a bold policy agenda to address 
uh, economic inequality in the housing market and in the workplace. And our priorities this year are housing data transparency, equitable labor standards, affordable housing, data surveillance protections, and more. And finally, we have the System Reset Initiative, which is helping companies create on-ramps for people returning from incarceration. And we're partnering with just as involved people and organizations to get System Reset into every tech company in California. So what can you do today? You can do three things right after you get off this call. You can tell a friend about our work. You can sign up for a community conversation, which is basically just a one-on-one -on -one with me where we can talk to you a little bit more about your journey at Tech Equity and what you're able to do and how do you like to further participate. Or you can take action with us by becoming a volunteer, supporting some of our legislation. So now I'll talk about that uh, priority legislation. So the first up is the Pay Transparency for Pay Equity Act, um, also known as SB 1162, and that's just Senate Bill SB 1162. That would make pay equity reports public so that all workers have the information that they need to ensure that there's equal pay for equal work. It ensures uh, that companies create a fair and equal playing field for all workers by posting salaries in the job description and posting promotional opportunities to their existing employees before selecting a candidate. So there's multiple ways to support um, bills such as these. Uh, the legislative cycle is about to wrap up, so um, the opportunities are a bit limited. But in the past, we've had volunteers call into committee hearings, um, sign petitions online, um, and yeah. Uh, so up next, we have um, two events coming up. Uh, both of them are book club discussions. You don't have to have read the book to join um, the events, they're uh, pretty general, and we have an opportunity to discuss the topic at large with the authors. So the first is Seek and Hide. Uh, that one is next week, 12 to 1 p.m., also a webinar style. And then uh, the next one is Fight Like Hell. So Seek and Hide is around uh, privacy and digital surveillance, and then Fight Like Hell is more about um, labor. So if you're interested in either of those two, um, I can send a follow-up link with uh, how to register for those two. Um, so as I mentioned, you can do three things right after you get off this call, tell a friend about our work, you know, sign up for a one-on-one -on -one with me, and, or you could take action with us on some of our uh, legislation. I'm sure that was quite a bit of information, so I'll take a minute or two to answer some questions. Um, uh, the webinar is recorded. I will send out the recording. I will send out a link to the presentation slides to you as well, so no need to worry about that. And like I said, if you have another question or you'd like to sign up for, you know, a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me, you know, I'd be happy to um, do that. Oh yeah. So Felicia, yeah. How can I sign up for a community conversation? Yeah. Just respond to the follow-up email I send um, and I can share with you my Calendly link, which is just a link with my availability and we can talk one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, happy to answer any questions. I think there's also a link on the follow-up email with that as well. Um, cool. Not seeing any more questions, which is totally fine. Like I said, uh, if you have a question later, um, response to that follow-up email, you know, I'd be more than happy to uh, remain connected with all of you. Um, so yeah, you know, take care. Look out for that follow-up email and enjoy your weekends. Thank you.